Well, hello again, Riverland College, Section 71. Um, you know, I've only got so many backgrounds to try to make this as interesting as possible. And just, even though it's another warm day here, I'm coming out to my, my favorite room in my house, which is, a, it's a glass porch um, that I made with my uh, German carpenter about 10, 12 years ago. He and I spent a whole summer on it. Mike Durkis, I'm missing that guy uh, today all of a sudden. Uh, this is our end of the week lesson, and I'm uh, reminiscing about a professor that I had a long time ago at the University of Minnesota, and I'm a little embarrassed that I cannot remember his name. It's okay, I only had him for a 10-week uh, quarter, and I'm proud of the fact that I pretty much can march through school and summon and return in thought to every teacher that I had, each grade, Mrs. Larson in kindergarten, Sister Maculata in first grade, Mrs. Kang in second grade, Sister Armella in third grade, on and on, pretty much all the way through school, because <clears throat> that's where I've been my entire life, school, the world of school, it's where I'm li living it all out. I can't remember the name of this professor, and what's strange is I can remember the building that I experienced him in, Peak Hall, at the University of Minnesota, I remember the classroom. I remember the faces of some of the people that were around me, even though this is 1984. I remember his office. It was like the messiest office I'd ever seen an academic have, just stuff piled everywhere. And I remember too, that he really seemed pretty intent on, on committing suicide with jelly donuts. I'm pretty sure he ate them until he exploded. He ate them constantly. And most importantly, I remember him telling me in an education class that Three is a magic number in a classroom. And I took that to heart. Sometimes I have four things to talk about, sometimes five. But I do have three things uh, that I'd like to communicate some stuff about to you from my heart. I'd like to talk about course requirements. They're dead simple. You already got them. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> I want to talk about trying to uh, place this course in the history of the liberal arts, which is... Um, in big trouble right now. Uh, it's even worse um, it's with the onset of the pandemic. And um, I gotta start looking at the news. It's a line of poetry from William Merwin, the whole world is burning. And we'll see how things go. I'm gonna try to keep these at about the half hour mark, maybe a little more, we'll see. And I'd also like today to try to, try to get going on teaching you something about writing. Uh, Friday, uh, or it will be Friday when you get this, because I'll let it download all night. And um, if it's a writing class, you probably deserve to know something about that um, subject. Uh, editorializing, too. <clears throat> you know, I'm shooting these videos in, in 4K, uh, or at least 1080. And you don't have to watch them in 1080. Probably would take a long time for them to download on your end. If you want to see what I'm really going to be achieving with my equipment in the next week and a half that's on its way, well, you know, give one a give, give one a try. Let it download. Go make a sandwich. <clears throat> but you can watch them at any rate you want. Uh, I hope you don't speed me up, though. We'll have, we'll talk about that another time. But before I do these three things, and before I offer this lesson to you, I want to thank you for taking this class and for being my students. Like I just wrote in D2L, your syllabus is on the way. It's a little little late. <clears throat> uh, Riverland wants us to use a template down there, and I should have done that already. But it's on the way, and don't worry, my courses are easy. That's why they're full. I'm not kidding. It's because I'm easy. But let's begin with a bad idea. Um, you saw my other little study that I've returned to since my son is moving out and taking up independent living. And, uh, this is another little study that I have, or another bookshelf, but this is only poetry. Pretty much everything that's here, there's some Christian stuff here too, but this is almost entirely poetry. I have several hundred books of poetry. And my wife looks at them the same way she looks at my guitars. She'll say, don't you have enough guitars? And I'll, just, I'll look at her like she's nuts as much as I love her. She says the same thing about my poetry books. Don't you have enough books of poetry? Next year, I'm going to order another $1,500 worth of them with faculty, faculty development funds. You can never have enough guitars or books of poetry or things of beauty in your house. Reading every poem isn't what matters. I'm all about the stash, man, have them. So here's the bad idea. Oh, let's hope it's not a bad idea. Without looking, I'm only going to be looking at you. I'm going to pick out a book of poems here, and I'm going to hope for two things. I'm going to grab the book. I'm going to read you a poem. Hopefully I don't land in the middle of a poem. 
and I hope that there's, um, I hope I can read it, and I hope it's a good poem. I also hope that I can say something inter interesting about the poet. Some of these poets are new to me, so I'm kind of crossing my fingers here. And I won't read the poem if there's a naughty word in it, because this class is rated PG. Ready? Oh, I close my eyes. Oh, Robert Pinsky. This is his brand new book at the Foundling Hospital. Uh, this is the only poet who has been the U.S. Poet Laureate four times for four consecutive years. I got to have dinner with him in around 1992, and I was going to host him um, pretty soon because he's, he's getting to be an older dude. What's in, I, I was hoping I could say something interesting. What's interesting about Robert Pinsky is that he loves to recite his poems in a kind of a performance mode to jazz music. So his thing is, he'll show up at a venue, like a school or a university or a museum or wherever he's going to read. He's on my Facebook, too. We're, we're friends, Facebook friends. And, and he, he wants to meet with the musicians about an hour before he performs, and then he gets on the stage with them, and they improvise uh, jazz music to, uh, to his poetry. Let's, let's hope here. Well, that's too long. Got to try it again. Okay, we'll do, we'll do this one. Mixed chorus, Robert Pinsky. My real name is Israel Balin. My father was a Roman slave who gained his freedom. Freedom. I was first named Ralph Waldo El, Ralph Waldo Ellison, but I changed it to the name of one of your cities because I was born a Jew in Bailo, Russia. I sit with Shakespeare, and he winces not. My other name is Flaccus. I wrote an essay on the theme you choose, your ancestors. I won't be any feeble conventional wings I'll rise on. Not I, born of poor parents. Look, my ankles are changed already. New white feathers are sprouting on my shoulders. These are my wings. Across the color line, I summon Aurelius and Aristotle, threading, threading through Philistine and Amicalite. They come, all graciously and without condescension. I took the name Irving or Caesar or Creole Jack. Someday they'll study me in Hungary, Newark, and L.A. So spare me your needless tribute. Spare me the red hideousness of Georgia. I wrote your white Christmas for you. And my third name, Burghardt, is Dutch. For all you know, I'm related to Spinoza, Walcott, Pissarro. And in fact, my grandfather Burkhart's name was Othello. And smart people are always dropping names. I'll do. Uh, I'm not smart, but I drop names too. Okay, eight minutes in. I gotta. We'll, we'll try to keep the poems short. And I've got to not be in a hurry. And I'm not 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 got to be self conscious because about being interesting and fast and everything. Production values are kind of low with just an iPhone. There are three course requirements uh, to succeed in this comp one, even if it's asynchronous, because you're gonna be interacting with one another on the discussion board. I've never used that before, but we're using it here. Um, so you can get to know one another and you can set about forming a community, because that's what I believe in, class has community. The three requirements are uh, patience and wonder and love. Patience is necessary because we live in a world where everything is demanded in, in, in a fast way. We want everything fast, and this has gotten worse and worse and worse. Everything's just sped up to the point where um, we need everything in, in, in a minute, and that's one of the reasons why these iPhones are just so addicting. Um, they're just like crystal meth. I mean, they just get you whatever you want, fast. You want a pizza? Bam. You want to watch a movie? Well, it's there in your palm, isn't it? Um, and, and I think um, one of the things that I think the pandemic might be about is slowing us down, creating, maybe creating silence. I recently read a whole book on silence, the value of silence, um, which is what I'm headed for in a number of years when I retire. Things are going to get a little bit quieter, although I don't entire, in, intend to retire, like I've already told you, until I'm dead. Um, I like to just keep talking and doing this nearly sacred work. You need to be patient. Be patient with each other and be patient with me. And I'll do my best to be patient with you. 
I've tried to be patient with the hailstorm of emails from some of you that I've been trying to answer. And uh, let's all work on, on patience together. Wonder is a thing. It, I mean, we know that, but when you hear the wonder, the word wonder, you might think that that's synonymous with curiosity. Not, not necessarily. Curiosity can get you in trouble, right? How many kids in this country today are going to get curious about what it feels like to, to be high, for instance, or, or look at pornography, which you're going to hear me proclaim to be a terrible evil more, more than once? Well, curiosity is going to get a lot of people in trouble today. By wonder, I'm talking about a sense of awe that, that you must not lose. You can't lose it. You had it when you were little. If you think back to when you were little, when everything was amazing to you, if you, if you, if you ever, ever take a child to a museum or a zoo, uh, take a six or seven or eight year old child to a zoo, it's really an astonishing thing to behold. And what happens is um, this world, which has got some evil in it, sort of just punches that in the head as we get older. And it, it, it can be a thing that can be lost. Wonder is a sense of awe. Wonder is the capacity to be amazed by something. And you gotta try to keep it going. And I'm gonna work really hard at instilling wonder in you regarding life, regarding literature, regarding art, music, um, and, and, and our humanity as we, as we form this class as community. Um, I've, I've just sort of seen so many people um, lose it, that sense of wonder, and I've, I've seen people really hang on to it too. Some of the oldest poets I know are just complete, they remain complete prodigious noticers of the world and the details of the world. That's the only difference between genius poets and us. They're just regular people every time with the exception of Merwin, I'll talk about him another day. The only thing that sets them apart, that enables them to be writers, is their level of awareness and the fact that they are prodigious noticers. Wonder is important enough to me that I'm actually gonna post up a video that my son created on Wonder uh, during, uh, actually it was the fall of his senior year. And I'll maybe tell you that story, it's real fast. What happened was um, he was 22 years old and he won, uh, he became a, a fellow. Uh, he won a $7,000 fellowship. And uh, he didn't, he spent the summer sort of not doing what he should have been doing with them. I mean, they just gave him all this money and he was obligated to write a paper and create some kind of product for something they have at St. John's and St. Ben's called Creativity Day. I'm, I, I'm so proud of him. I love that guy. He's a teacher like me, an English teacher, but he kind of wasted the summer. He laid around on the front porch texting his girlfriend that he married last year. And at the end of the summer, I'm like, you know what? They gave you $7,000. The Lindmark Foundation gave you a lot of money. You better do something, have some integrity. And he made a pretty high quality video and what's fascinating is he needed my help getting people to be on the video. And it, it's really interesting um, what he did. He found on his own an elementary teacher, and she's in the video. Um, I'm kind of friends with the bishop in our diocese, Bishop Donald Kettler in the St. Cloud Diocese. So we got Donald Kettler makes an, uh, several cameos in it. A beloved colleague of mine. Um, we're, we're different men, but Adam Marcotte is one of the smartest people professors at my college. The guy's a, a, an absolute genius. And I broke a rule to get him another speaker. At the time he, the time he was making the video, I was hosting an American poet named the Jay Sashadri, originally from Bangalore, India. Now, there's the, the rule is this. When you're hosting a poet, you stick to the contract, whether it came out of California, London, Boston, New York, you stick to the contract, or to put it another way, you stick to the itinerary and you are not supposed to add anything. You're not supposed to say, hey, come visit this class, or let's go here, or let's have dinner with the, these people. You stay with it. And Vijay Sashadri was so sweet, I, I dared to ask him, would you be willing to be interviewed for this film that my son is making about wonder? And he was like, absolutely. And so the day of the poetry reading, before we headed up to Brainerd in the morning, he's, you'll see, it's in my living room. Vijay is in there, and he too is on the video on, on wonder. And you might find that, I hope you like it. I hope you enjoy that. It's pretty, uh, and you'll see what kind of videographer my son was at the time. He's way better now. And proud's not the right word to use, but it, what's beautiful about it is that he used our property, our farm, 
as a backdrop uh, um, for, for the creation of that little documentary he made. So you need patience and you need wonder. The big one I've already talked about on my introduction video. Let's go fast so I can get to these other two items. Please, please bring love to this class. I'm always misspeaking. I'm so self-conscious. You, you need to have love. And we need go no further than a passing glance at our world to see that it is suddenly full of hatred and, and evil, I would call it sin, like never before. And the only way to stand up to that is with love. Love is my way of cutting through everything. I love every student that comes in my classroom. It doesn't matter who they are, uh, where they're from, what they're like. I vow to love them. And you have to love each other, especially in those discussion boards. Let's um, love each other and manifest that love with courtesy and respect and celebration of our humanity. There's just no other way to live in the world. There just, it just isn't. We have to bring lo um, love to everything that we um, do in the world. So please, please work on that. Please work on that. One way of thinking of it is to recognize, and this is different because this is a class where it's online. That's how Riverland wanted it, and that's okay. Those are popular classes. But when you w walk into a, a regular classroom or walk to a walk into a workplace or maybe go to a social gathering or a, or a church or a theater or wherever, there's going to be other human beings there. And the stance to have, the tilt to have, is one of celebration. And if you can't celebrate, if, especially if you find somebody different than you, you know, it's not hard to like, every, it's not easy to like everyone that you meet. One of the things to keep in mind, I'm almost done with this part, is to recognize and accept the fact that none of us can help who we are. None of us. I, for instance, am a number of things, obviously. I didn't, well, I chose some of them, but I certainly didn't choose many of them. And let's just rattle it off. I'm a man. I'm married to a woman. Um, I'm white. Beige, actually. Splotchy, pink, beige. I'm a, I'm a beige guy. Um, what's the old list again? I'm male. I'm white. Um, I'm, I'm married to a woman. I'm a father. Uh, I come from a middle-class background. I'm uh, possibly overeducated. Um, I uh, am a person of faith. You might not be. So, but there's, let's just respect each other anyway. I am a Christian. I am a devout Roman Catholic, and I'm not secretive uh, about that. None of these things that I've listed are at all fashionable. Okay, they're just not cool at all, and I was cool, but I'm not. I'm not anymore. You, you, you're probably not sixty. Uh, I, I'm. You're probably possibly of a. Of a, uh, of, you're just. Di we're all different. So let's just be different. I uh, am so happy to meet sometimes people that are just like me. I go, wow, you're just like me. We're the same person. I got a call from a guy the other day who wants me to write a book with him. This world. This world-class businessman. Somehow he found a thing that I wrote on the internet for actually for a magazine this spring on um, St. Michael the Archangel and he calls me up and pretty after half an hour we were like, wow, you and I got a lot in common. I There are people that I meet that I don't have anything in common with. It's always way more interesting. You must, you must get this, right? I hosted Naomi Shihab Nye because I'm not Palestinian. I hosted Spencer Reese a couple years ago. I brought him from all the way from Spain. You know, and I'm not gay, but I, I, I loved riding in a car with him. Uh, Richard Blanco, um, I'm not Cuban. That's why I had Richard Blanco, the inaugural poet come. I'm happy meeting people that are like me, and I'm even happier meeting people that are different than me because they help me see the world with perspectives that I don't have. Got it? 19 minutes in. Love? and patience and wonder. And there's that line in one of those St. Paul letters. In the end, faith, hope, and love remain, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I don't think I can quote my Bible, because I can't. If I were evangelical, I could. They know their Bibles. I love those people. Now, this is a class that I'm offering you in the liberal arts tradition. 
and I think maybe uh, there's some ways of, of approaching that. There's many tensions in the, in the men's state system. There's, for instance, a tension we've already talked about between online learning and face-to-face -face learning. And while an awful lot of it is online, at least at my college this semester. There's also a very serious tension between the liberal arts side of things and the technical side of things. So I don't know, I don't know exactly how it is down in Riverland. I'm just getting to learn about what it's like. But on, we have two campuses at Central Lakes College. We have um, the liberal arts campus which is where, my, where, my, where I teach, and that's at Brainerd. And I'm there with the biologists and the sociologists and the psychologists and the mathematicians and the geographers and the chemistry teacher. I love that guy. There's even a, um, you know, that you get it, right? There's different disciplines there. Uh, technical education in the system is also a huge deal because people get jobs. Uh, people that study robotics at Staples campus and the technical campus with, with Professor Nate, they get eight 20 year old ki uh, kids study robotics for two years, it's technical, and suddenly they're making as much money as I am and I'm clapping for them. The liberal arts it, is suffering. It, it was suffering before the pandemic began. It just is. Uh, other things have uh, risen uh, to prominence in education, and I'll be talking about this on other days. Um, we have um, STEM, STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's a big deal right now, and I get that because people want to eat and live, and they want to get jobs. Uh, business is really big right now. There are entire colleges uh, that used to be liberal arts colleges, authentically, and um, they, they sold their soul to business and economics and accounting because money drives a lot of things. How serious I am about the liberal arts? Well, my wife and I put our sons through St. John's University and my wife proclaimed, she put her foot down. She said, they are not borrowing a penny. I'm like, okay, so we're gonna fund their education. And I'm, it, it'll sound like I'm bragging it, it's just math. Across my 50s, over a six and a half year period, I put my money where my mouth is, and I gave St. John's University probably three hundred and well, probably about three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to get them both four-year degrees, and they graduated and they got jobs, and I'm proud of them. Uh, we destroyed our financial future to create theirs, and it was I couldn't have done a more intelligent thing. And I know that that's not a lot of that's not a story that's common to a lot of people. Um, I know your, your folks love you, um, but they probably are not going to be able to do that. That's how important the liberal arts to, are to me. I invested in it. In more trouble now is the humanities. The humanities is really, truly suffering. In 1968, 18% of the students at college and university in the United States of America were humanities majors. I don't know exactly where that's at right now, but it's down to, uh, it's got to be down to about 2 or 3%. And there are departments that are collapsing uh, with brothers and sisters of mine, friends of mine, um, panicking about it. Really, America, are we, have we really arrived at a time where we don't want English majors or history majors or theologians or art historians um, or music historians? It's, 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 it's heartbreaking. And it's happened very fast across my lifetime. And I'm going to offer you this writing class uh, as a person who's, for whom the liberal arts and humanities are the, the meaning of my life. That's what I'm living for. For what will you live? You should ask yourself that question. For what will you live? For whatever you decide, you're gonna, whatever you're going to live for, that's going to be what you're going to die for. Think about that. What will be the meaning of your life? How are you going to answer the call to live and inhabit a pretty important question, which is about how you're going to find us accept the solemn obligation to live a meaningful life that has purpose and absorbing work. Good luck. I, I'm, that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm offering you this class. So that's just kind of a, 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 a way above the terrain way of thinking about it. So there's another way I think about the liberal arts, and I don't have, a, I'm getting a four by six whiteboard so I can draw and do pictures and stuff, and that's not gonna come until mid-September, although my big camera comes Monday and the rest of the stuff will come pretty quickly. I'm not in E339, so I just 
just kind of piece of paper, right? And um, I'll just show this to you for a second. This is another way of thinking about the liberal arts. Uh, it's kind of my theory of funnels. And I have uh, three people depicted here. I'm funnel number one. Fun funnel number two is my brother-in-law, Patrick. And funnel number three is a dear friend of mine who's got a lot of smoke in his yard this week. My friend Tom Donnelly who lives in Berkeley, California. He's out there trying to survive all these fires. This is it, not d definitive. Nothing I'm telling you is definitive. This is just a theory of mine. It's a way of thinking about the liberal arts, and it's this simple. When, as you move through school, what's going to happen is you're going to go from uh, a, a series of communities to a discourse community that becomes ever more specific, right, as you move through it. So those of you that are PSEO students in high school, you're probably taking all kinds of classes, right? Because you're at the top of your funnel where the generality is wide. I've seen high school students take five, six, seven, eight classes. And that's why we do that because we want to give you an opportunity to figure out what you're good at, um, right? And when you're way up here in the funnel, the idea is really, to put it another way, to know a little bit about a lot of different things. And what happens is, with most people, is that you, you move from a situation where you're learning a little bit about a lot of things to an awful lot about a little thing, because we live in an era of specialization. Nobody explained this to me when I was a kid. I just didn't get it. So I'm, I'll use my example as the first one. When I arrived at St. John's University in 1978 to pursue my liberal arts education, I, all I knew is that I loved books and I wanted to read, especially poetry. I wanted classes that were made out of words. If they were made out of numbers, I was in trouble. I just, I should have given them more of a chance, but all I knew is that I wanted to read and that I, I, I loved literature. Well, as I moved through my funnel, you know, you know, you take English classes, lower division, higher division, you take care of your general requirements. Um, and eventually I found myself, uh, so stupid, I had to go to graduate school twice, So right? So it, up here, all I know is that I want to read. I'm a long-haired kid with a Fender Stratocaster. And at this point, I'm a 60-year-old man who's completely preoccupied and obsessed with imaginative literature, especially poetry. And I, I don't consider myself an expert on anything, but I, I do, I'm, it got more specific, didn't it, all right? That's all I think about. Um, my brother-in-law, Patrick, arrives, Sox Center boy, Arrives at St. John's University in 1978, along with me. He went on to marry my sister. That's why he's my brother-in-law. And all, all he knew is the opposite. He wanted numbers. He wanted to uh, study natural sciences. So he does that. And then he decides he wants to go to medical school. And he does. And then, But then the question becomes, in the same way, it's what kind of English major? What kind of doctor do you want to be? Well, he wanted to be a radiologist. And he's a good one. And he's just a little north of you at the Mayo Clinic. And he is a very famous man, and he's a genius. And my friend Tom uh, is the third funnel here. And he um, was more like me. He, he took a lot of history classes with me, my history major. Uh, he's from Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, he starts out uh, as a theologian. Well, then he goes on and gets a master's degree in history. And then he took a PhD in history, but it's the same question. Well, what kind of historian? You must, I don't have to belabor this point, right? Um, I go to a party and unless there's people that want to talk about poetry, I'm, I'm kind of silent. Um, Patrick starts out a natural history major and at the at bottom of his funnel, in terms of specificity, he's an expert on a radioactive isotope called technetium. I don't even want to know what technetium is, but he does. And my dear friend Tom, uh, whose kid was on Sesame Street once, he, he, Tom starts out a history major, a theologian, and he's written several books uh, on the presence of the Jews in 16th century Spain. That's pretty specific. You're not bound by this. You can plunge outside of it. My friend Tim Knowles, who uh, lives in California now, has no idea that I'm talking about him. He started out as a history major. I wasn't going to talk about him. Well, he plunged outside of it, left his wife, left his, left his family, ran away with another woman, and started up a new life in his 50s. He's got a small child now, uh, my age, actually. Well, he's a long way from history, isn't he? He's in California selling lawn ornaments. I don't, I don't get that. Uh, I know there's a lot of lawns in California that need lawn ornaments, and 
but if that's what he wants to be is the meaning of his life, well, I'm not knocking that. He's got to, we all got to eat and live. You know, I'm at the 30 minute mark and I'm going to, I'm not going to take it any further uh, for today. I, I, I said I would try to keep this at half an hour, but I've also got to work to keep this in sync with my two comp one sections up in Brainerd. And I, I've, I've flubbed uh, here and there here, but I, I think I'll, I don't need to edit this. I'll just get this uh, uploading tonight while I sleep and dream the dreams are reserved for an English major, uh, which are all about poetry and synonyms and metaphors. And um, you'll, ha you'll have this tomorrow. Now, once in a while, I might go, don't, I'm not, don't hold me to the half an hour thing. Once in a while, I might go over uh, because, I, again, I have to keep things all lined up because it's really important that I not go crazy. And I don't think I will. So bless you all. I hope you're safe down there. We've got some cooler weather coming, at least to central Minnesota, uh, which means I can get out in the woods and comfortably look for chanterelle mushrooms. I've been grabbing those babies by the basket. It's the it's time of provision, right? Pears, apples, firewood, mushrooms, and uh, getting the freezers all full for the winter in the pandemic. Uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, I put up my contact information, D2L. Text me, email me anytime you want. Syllabus is on the way. See you soon.